It's Entomology Animated, celebrating the amazing biology of insects using the power of digital animation. Ding! So here's where I'm at with my rainbow scarab beetle. And I've gone in and added more detail to the other parts of the model. So the last video I focused mainly on the head, but as you can see, I've used many of the same techniques here on this part, and I've added a lot of detail to the elytra. I've re-sculpted parts of the legs to make it square with my reference, as well as the abdomen. So I've done a lot of work on this. I think the elytra was the most challenging part in terms of detailing, because it's got a mixture of kind of ideas going on here. So let's take a look at the reference so you understand why I'm sculpting it the way I did. So when I take the reference, I get to this point, I wanna, I'm gonna take a close look at it and start kind of figuring out what's going on here and how to make these details. So there was a lot of hand sculpting involved. So let's take a look at a time lapse to show you how I kind of did, got this or tried to get this look into my model here with a little bit of, you know, artistic interpretation where necessary. So let's look at a time-lapse movie. So you can see I've got the basic detail here and now I'm starting to kind of fill out or, or emphasize some of these larger details as kind of like these bubbly tracks is the way I was thinking of them. So we have these sort of peaks and valleys here. This is the mountain range, this is the valley. I'm focusing on the peaks of the mountain right here. And if you take a look at the reference, it's kind of like these bubbly little lines, these main lines right here, which are then gonna kind of branch off. And then we've got smaller detail in between. So it took a lot of experimentation to get the kind of look I was going for. But I started with the larger details here, just these long sort of bubbly squiggly lines here. And I have uh, symmetry on for the most part, but when I start to work on the center part here, I turned off symmetry so it wasn't so obvious that I was kind of cheating. And I got little bubbly deviations. This is a great source of inspiration for creature models. Again, trying to get accuracy from nature, you know, build that into your repertoire is one of the best ways you can prepare for coming up for ideas for creatures if you're doing something out of your imagination or something for a client. It's a lot of work, but practice pays off. So let's uh, skip ahead a little bit here and take a look at the finer details. So I'm adding kind of now thinner veins in between and you can see I'm alternating between holding the alt brush to sculpt in and letting go of the alt brush to kind of push out. But I'm doing some deviations here to kind of create sort of that randomness in between these larger peaks. This is the finished version right here. So I've got kind of the large parts, the smaller parts and the branches, and then the noise in between. So you can kind of see that. And uh, the way I went about doing this, if we go back to the time lapse, you can see I'm sculpting in the smaller branches here. So I'm doing a lot of hand sculpting with the inflate brush. So that's how I did that. You can see there's a lot of leftover fine detail from my initial pass, which I've left into the highest level of subdivision. I'm gonna kind of use that and just kind of exaggerate it in just a moment. And to do that, I use a lot of cavity masking. And uh, if you go into the masking palette, mask by cavity, if I hit this, you'll see that after a few moments, it creates a mask based on the surface detail, cavities in the detail. And you can even go into the cavity profile. This is the profile that I use. I just discovered this randomly by playing with it. Let's reset it here real quick. Let's do a reset. And then just play with the graph a little bit. Hit mask by cavity, wait a few moments. And it'll create a new mask. Sometimes it's a huge difference. Sometimes it's not much of a difference. But I just play with it till I get something that I think is gonna look pretty good. Um, or uh, other times I'll use mask by smoothness. Let's check that out. This is a bit simpler to use. You can kind of see the mask that it creates and if I invert it, I get this kind of thing. But I'm kind of taking advantage of the detail that I've already gotten. I also need mask by peaks and, peaks and valleys is useful. That creates kind of a spotty look. So I kind of use a combination of that and then I hide the mask with Control-H 
and kind of use inflate brush or clay brush or a combination of brushes to kind of bring out that detail. And so this is kind of what it looks like in progress. So if I skip ahead a little bit. There we go, applying a mask, hiding the mask, then using kind of uh, different brushes, inflate or clay in a Z sub mode to kind of just push in some details. So you can see I'm stamping out details and smoothing it. And then what I'm gonna do, I've decided it's way too strong. Overall, it's too much. So I've gone down to a lower subdivision level and smoothed out, obliterated all that detail on the lower subdivision. Let's take a look in ZBrush here. So if you go down to a lower subdivision level and say smooth this out, so I'm gonna just completely obliterate, let's clear the mask of course. Okay, completely obliterate this detail on the lower subdivision. And if I go back to the highest subdivision level, what you'll see is that part that I smoothed out, the detail is still there, but it's kind of pushed back a little bit. So it's not quite so strong. And you get some kind of interesting, very interesting looking uh, surface with this that you might not get otherwise. Um, and you can experiment with going down to say just a couple subdivision levels and say, what's, what if I smooth that out, go to the higher subdivision level and you can kind of see the results. So maybe that's too much, but it's, it's kind of uh, reminiscent of applying a solvent to clay, um, you know, just to kind of knock back the details. And I do that quite a bit. Um, so let's talk about the rest of the model, because I kind of finished up the Elytra where I got it to a point where I'm happy with it in ZBrush. And now what I'm doing is I'm kind of fixing the abdomen. So you can see after I retopologize these parts and to subdivide them, I got these big gaps in between. So now I'm just going in and uh, just kind of tucking parts of the model underneath, you know, for these various parts of the abdomen. Let's take a look at some reference. So if we take a look at our reference here, you can see that we have some overlap. The, uh, this one overlaps this one, which overlaps this one, which overlaps this one, which is a bit typical for, for uh, insects, but not completely universal. So always make sure that you check your references. I, I know I spent a fair amount of time sculpting abdomens and gasters wrong because I made an assumption that all insect abdomens, uh, the sclerites, which are these pieces, worked the same way, and that's not true. It changes from one type of insect to another. So always refer to your, sub, your um, reference. But anyway, so I did some tucking. You can see in the um, in the time lapse. What I'll usually do is I'll separate these parts into uh, polygroups, like doing auto groups. So each one, each piece is its own auto group, and then I'll do mask by auto group so that I can easily pull these in and out without having to constantly mask or hide parts. Um, and that's really useful. And you also notice that I'm doing this at a very low subdivision, lowest subdivision level, uh, just because I'm only concerned about the shape at this point. I'll subdivide it and then add some subtle detail. Again, let's take a look at the reference. You can see that we got a lot of sort of, you know, bits of damage, bits of bubbly parts, just a little bit of noise. Eventually we're gonna have hairs in these things. Hairs are extremely important to make your insects look real. Look at all this hair that we have here. It's going to be quite a uh, quite a task, and we're going to we're going to do that a little bit later on uh, after we've done a lot of other things. And I'm, I'm going to do all the hairs in my after this thing as opposed to ZBrush, and you'll understand when I get to that section. But that's in a later video. So now I've subdivided the model, and I'm starting to put in the detail using the Damien Standard Brush to really bring out this lip and then doing some kind of larger kind of lines and smoothing them back, Damien Standard Brush on the edges, smoothing them, adding just kind of random divots. Now I'm going through here and adding some noise with this spray brush. Notice I'm like laying down noise and then smoothing it, laying down noise and then smoothing it with, uh, I think I was using uh, the clay brush with kind of mask by noise. Um, 
adding some surface noise, kind of like what I did on the Elytra. So it created some surface noise and shows mask by noise, and then use the inflate brush to kind of bring out the surface detail. So that's always my favorite part of the process because I find that that's kind of the dessert. Anytime I'm doing detailing, I'm usually happy. So now I've moved on to the thorax, and this is a very interesting part of this particular beetle, this weird sort of shape right here. And I had to spend a lot of time looking through my microscope. It doesn't look that impressive to your average creature designer who goes absolutely crazy with detail. But in the, again, I'm really trying to be accurate, as accurate as possible uh, with what I can see through the microscope and the references that I can find online. And so that means going back and really examining the detail and the shapes and the forms and asking myself, you know, am I sculpting what I really see? Is this an accurate representation? Because again, you won't find reference for this particular part of this particular beetle online. You're lucky if you can find even a picture of the underside of a lot of beetles. The web is just not a great resource. So you gotta look through uh, a microscope. And is this absolutely right? It's as right as I could think I could get. So let's take a look at my reference here. As you can see, we have several problems. We have hairs in the way. We have a shininess to the surface, and this is the same thing if I'm looking through the microscope, and that can really mess with your eyes. So even if you're looking through stereoscopic microscope, you have to, well, all I can say is anybody who's tried to sculpt the back of a human being knows that your eyes start to play tricks on you the more you think you know what you're seeing and, and how that versus what you're actually seeing. So there's a lot of back and forth and trying to get these forms right and it always looks easier than it actually is. Or maybe I'm just a big dummy, that's also a possibility. But in any case, I went back and I really spent some time going over and over these parts to make sure that they, they resembled what I saw. You know, if there's an extensive anatomical reference to uh, rainbow scarab beetles, I have yet to find it because there's not, you know, there's some decent stuff online, but there's no money in making a beetle anatomy book, not like there is in a human anatomy book. So you got to kind of figure these things out. If you're lucky enough to have an expert who can tell you that this is right or wrong, that's always really useful. But um, again, there's not a whole lot of people who are experts in all aspects of an anatomies for beetles. There are 400,000 species of beetles too, so that's something to keep in mind. 400,000 known species. So you can see I kind of carved out some lines here to kind of establish these forms. And then I'm using the clay brush to kind of sculpt in and build those out. So again, it's back and forth, looking through the microscope, sculpting, trying to get as close as I can. I believe for these parts of the model, I do have Sculptress mode turned on so that it will dynamically add uh, geometry where I need it. I did find that useful for this part of the model. Of course, it means I'm gonna to have to go back and retopologize this surface, but I don't mind doing that. Uh, the other thing I did for this is I did take one, you know, I got several specimens from butterflies and things that I can check out under my microscope, and I did cut up at least one of the specimens so that I could see these parts without the legs in the way. Now it's a bit of a grisly thing and it's not easy because I'm applying like an exacto knife. And these things are kind of slippery so sometimes when I hit them the parts fly across the room. I have spent a fair amount of time on my hands and knees looking at the carpet, carpet trying to find like the foot of an insect that flew off of my microscope stand. And I'm always amazed when I can actually find them um, because they look, I mean these things are tiny, they look like little specks. So, um, God forbid I'm working on like a forward fly or something like that because those the entire forward fly is about the size of a head of a pin. So here are the forms that I've sculpted into the thorax area, the underside. Uh, you can see it in context here with the legs. So I'm going to end this video here. We focused on sculpting detail into the elytra, uh, fixing the abdomen, creating this overlap and then establishing the forms of the thorax and the underside. In the next video, we're gonna talk about detailing the thorax and also taking a look at how I sculpted the legs and detailing the legs. So that's coming up next.